Good evening and welcome to tonight's cardiology webinar. Thank you to everyone for joining us on this beautiful warm June evening. I hope you have found a nice cool spot in the house to join us from. My name is Lydia Morgan and I'm commercial manager here at VVS. I'll be introducing our speaker for this evening, Dr. Brigitte Pedro, with the second instalment of her, her webinar series on echocardiography. Don't worry if you missed part one, we'll share the link of the recording with you so you can catch up at your convenience. We hope by the end of the session, you understand that you don't need to manage your cardiology cases alone. VVS have a team of friendly and knowledgeable veterinary specialists who can support you with advice calls, written reports, radiology requests, halter monitors, or with our HALO service, our live guided specialist consultations. I personally find both obtaining and interpreting cardiac images a little tricky. So if you're similar to me, you might appreciate a cardiology specialist guiding you through. With VVS, you can have just that. Our experienced cardiology specialists, such as the lovely Brigitte, who's speaking this evening, can see your ultrasound image in real time. They can see your hand as you're holding the probe and help you to find the right position to get the most diagnostic image. They'll also interpret the patient's ECG with you and listen in as you ask you to take their heart. Our brilliant cardiologists support and guide you through the process of a complete specialist cardiac workup and help you to establish a suitable treatment and management plan for your patient. This service can be possible in your practice through the installation of the VVS workstation, our sophisticated video sharing and diagnostic platform. If you don't have this already and it's of interest, please do email us at info at vvs.vet or visit our website www.vvs.vet and we'd be happy to tell you more. Do remember our advice calls and written reports can be accessed by any veterinary team in the UK. There's no need to register or subscribe and no equipment needed to access these services. VVS is truly an extension of your practice team. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Brigitte Pedro, European Specialist in Veterinary Cardiology, who'll be presenting the second part of her basic echocardiography session for us this evening. Brigitte completed her cardiology residency at the University of Liverpool, following which she became a lecturer in small animal cardiology there. After leaving Liverpool, Brigitte worked at one of the busiest interventional cardiology centres in the UK. In 2021, Brigitte moved back to Portugal, where she is currently working. She joined the VVS team in July that year, bringing with her a wealth of experience and knowledge, as well as her friendly, understanding approach. We're so pleased to have Brigitte presenting for us this evening. If you have any questions as we go through the webinar, please add them to the chat box, and we'll finish up the presentation with a question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to wonderful Brigitte. Well, thank you, Lydia, and uh, thank you, everyone that uh, is here tonight for the webinar. Uh, the weather is probably better in the UK today than, than in Portugal, so I do hope that the webinar will be good enough for you to lose these uh, few minutes, maybe one hour of um, really nice weather outside. So um, this, this webinar, it's going to be a little bit of a continuation of uh, the webinar that we had a few months ago, uh, where we discussed basic echocardiography, but uh, looking at the right side views of the, um, of the heart. So if you remember, and for those of you who have not seen the previous webinar, feel free to go, um, go back and watch it if, uh, if you'd like to. Um, what we discussed was not only the, the settings of the machine, how to choose the best probe um, for each specific patient, but um, we discussed a little bit also the position of uh, your arm, your wrist, your hand while you're scanning, because that is extremely important. And uh, that's something that I usually tell everyone whenever I'm doing a, a practical CPD about echocardiography, I always try to correct people in the way that they are sitting, the way that they are facing the machine, the position of their arms, because otherwise at the end of the day, you're going to be really sore. So that's actually quite Quite, quite important. And then we discussed also the positioning of the patient and um, also the sedation that some of these patients need. Because uh, at the end of the day, we do want to do a scan without sedation. But if your patient is really nervous, really wriggly, uh, really stressed, um, there are some sedation protocols that you can choose that are still quite safe from the point of view of the cardiovascular system that will help you having a better experience during the scan. It will make They will make your life easier and your patient's life also much easier. So also, um, at the time of the last scan, uh, at the last uh, webinar, uh, 
we did discuss uh, the right side views, as we said. So just as a quick reminder, keep in mind that your um, left atrium in the right parasternal long axis views they should it should be a square shape so square shape right uh, left atrium with the interitral septum almost parallel to the free wall and your left ventricle should have an elliptical shape with the contractility that it's not hyperdynamic so not too increased but not reduced so this is what the normal heart should look like um, we also went through some of the echocardiographic techniques like DM mode, the Doppler, like color Doppler and spectral Doppler. And if you remember, we did discuss some of the most common conditions like DCM, mitral valve disease, and uh, some congenital diseases like PDAs and pulmonic stenosis, how to identify them. So now we are going to talk mainly about the left side views. And the left side views, they are part of a complete heart scan, okay? So every time that we do a full cardiac workup, we should do the right side views and the left side views as well. However, if, um, if I have to be honest, I would say that I would prefer someone to know how to scan the right side properly. So do a perfect right side scan rather than doing a little bit of both sides because the right side at the end of the day is going to give you most of the information that you need the left side views they are of course also important but they will be like almost a complement to your right side views so most of the times you don't really um, change your diagnosis based on the left side views and most of the clinical decisions that you're going to take um, they will be um, based on what you see on the right side view. So you should, whenever you, you start scanning the right side, most of the times you have an idea of well, how to manage that patient even before looking at the left side views. But because we always want to do a complete scan, let's then go through the left side views to try to understand a little bit better what they can show us. And uh, the left side views, um, I also keep saying that they are much more challenging um, than the right side views. And when I say more challenging, I mean even technically more challenging because the way that you're going to hold the probe is actually quite uncomfortable. So I, I usually tell um, the vets that work with us when we are scanning, if you finish the scan and your hand is quite uncomfortable and it feels that you're in a really odd position, that's because you're doing it right. Okay, so the way that we start scanning the left side, usually we have our probe quite caudal in the chest, okay, uh, very, very close to the abdomen, and we are going to have our probe quite flat, so almost parallel to the floor, and pointing in the direction of the head of the dog. So if you imagine a lateral radiograph of uh, a patient, the way that you're going to be scanning the left side um, views, it's from the apex to the base of the heart. So if you imagine a lateral radiograph, you have your probe close to the apex of the heart and you're going to point in the direction of the base of the heart. So that, that's why you have, uh, you're pointing cranially and it is quite flat, the position that you hold the probe, because it needs to kind of dissect the heart in the longitudinal plane. OK, so the way that we start then, it's with the left apical four chambers view. And this is our, let's call it the home base view from the left side of the, um, of the chest. What we tend to see is the left atrium over here, the left ventricle, and then the right side of the heart. So your probe is over here at the top of the image, and you're scanning the heart upside down. If you pay attention, like we said for the right side views, also over here, the left atrium is usually small, like a square shape, and the left ventricle has an elliptical shape. In these views, you can have a general idea, again, of the, of the heart, so the dimensions of the chambers, a little bit also uh, the systolic function of the heart, even if you're going to use other uh, measurements to, to assess that in more detail. 
Uh, and you can also have an idea of the right side of the heart. So as, uh, as we said for the right side views, the right heart is usually much smaller than the left. And if you struggle to see it, that's completely normal, okay? In a normal patient, most of the times, you do struggle to get a good right side, um, um, a good uh, view of the right heart because it tends to be much smaller than the left. Then the other thing that we're going to assess as well in these uh, views, it's the, um, the leaflets of the, um, of the valves. So you can assess, especially the mitral valve. The tricuspid, we can assess it in a different view and we'll go through that later on. But in this case, you can assess um, first into the, and then with the color Doppler, the mitral valve leaflets. And if you pay attention, in this case, whenever you look at the mitral valve leaflets, they tend to be like two fine lines, very well defined, okay? That's what a normal mitral valve should look like. So after you assess its anatomy in 2D, then you can use the color Doppler to check if there is any uh, mitral regurgitation. So if uh, there is any insufficiency or not of the, the valve. So if this valve is incompetent or not. And most of the times in, uh, I would say probably most of the dogs, you shouldn't really have any degree of mitral regurgitation. And for those of you that are not as familiar with echocardiography as, um, as others, just to remind you, whenever we look at the color Doppler, Whatever is going away from our probe, it's uh, going to be uh, seen in blue. And whatever is going towards our probe, it's going to be in red. Okay. And in cases where you can see uh, mitral regurgitation, that is going to be usually a blue green jet because it is a high velocity jet. So it's a turbulent flow that will become um, green when it's a high velocity. Okay. But in a normal patient, then we don't really want to see any regurgitation. But sometimes we do end up seeing uh, significant degrees of regurgitation. Like in this case, you can see that uh, you have this blue-green jet of mitral regurgitation. Whenever we have mitral regurgitation and we can see it with the color Doppler, then the next thing that we want to do is to assess its velocity, okay? And the way that we're going to measure the velocity of the jet is by using our spectral Doppler. Because we know that the mitral regurgitation is going to be a high velocity jet, then we are going to use a continuous wave Doppler because that is the Doppler that allow us to measure high velocity flows. And in this case, if we do um, start our cursor, we can place it then over the mitral regurgitation flow, and we can start then our continuous wave Doppler that will give us an image like this that you can see here on the right side of your screen. And if you look at this, Whenever we are checking the, the velocity of the flow, it's by looking at the tip of these yellow envelopes. So you can see over here that the velocity of the flow gets close to six meters per second, okay? And that is completely normal. So as we said before, the mitral regurgitation jet tends to be, to be a high velocity. And the reason for this, it's because if you remember from the previous webinar, um, we said that the velocity is related to the pressure gradient between the chambers. And in this case, there is a high pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the left atrium. So there is a high difference, a big difference in the pressures. And that's why we have a um, high velocity jet. And in this image, I would just like to point out that sometimes whenever you're scanning a patient, even without having an ECG, if you pay attention to your image, if you pay attention to the small details, you may be able to pick up arrhythmias. Because, for example, in the image that you have here on the, um, on the right, you look at the envelopes and you can see that the interval between the envelopes, so the gap in between the envelopes, it's not always the same. So, for example, over here, you have a smaller gap 
in between the, the envelopes. That means that you have a premature bit, so a bit that comes earlier than normal. So even without an ECG, in this case, you could tell that probably this dog had an arrhythmia. And so the next step would then be to look at an ECG, okay? And again, for those of you that are not as familiar with the spectral Doppler as others, whenever we do uh, look at the spectral Doppler, whatever is below our baseline, and in this case, our baseline is over here, the top of our image, whatever is below the baseline is going away from our probe, whatever is above the baseline is going towards our probe. And in this case, if we look at uh, our to the image, we know that the mitral regurgitation is going away from our probe because our probe is going to be near the apex of the heart. So whenever we start a continuous wave Doppler, we know that we're going to be looking at the flow that goes away from our probe, so below the baseline. So we then check the anatomy of the valve. We check its uh, efficiency, if uh, it is competent or not, if uh, it allows regurgitation or not. And in case, in those cases where it does, we are going to check the velocity of the mitral regurgitation. And the velocity, it's a high velocity flow. If it is quite low, so if it is much lower than five, four meters per second, what we need to consider, it's either we are not very well aligned with our flow, which can underestimate the velocities, or the systolic function of this dog is so poor that is associated with a lower velocity jet, okay? So keep all these things in, um, in mind. And we said then that um, we do um, look at the anatomy of our uh, valves. And I just wanted to, to show you two examples of um, the most common changes that you will see uh, at the level of the mitral valve leaflets. So in the first case, you can see that the leaflets are maybe a little bit more thickened than normal. And when you look at them, they seem to be prolapsing into the left atrium. So whenever they join uh, each other, this position, it goes into the left atrium. So that is um, what we call mitral valve prolapse. So this image is actually quite typical of a dog with mitral valve disease. So thickened, um, thickened leaflets. So you start having the generative changes in the valve and you can also have more or less prolapsing of the, the valve leaflets. And in this case, if we were going to put the color Doppler to assess the valve in more detail, we would see obvious mitral regurgitation. And another thing, just to start pointing out some of the small details that can um, be important over time, if you look at the contractility of this heart, you can see that the contractility is actually quite good. So it's a, it has an increased contractility, which we discussed already last time in cases of mitral valve disease. Another thing that you can see as well when we look at the mitral valve leaflets is this type of uh, uh, change. This is what we call mitral dysplasia. So the leaflets, one of them tends to be sometimes longer than the other. And in these left apical views, the, um, the anatomy of the, the leaflets is quite typical because it almost looks like that they are clapping their hands, okay? So one of our colleagues, the other, another cardiologist of VVS, Joao, um, usually describes these valves as Nicole Kidman clapping her hands. And that is actually quite, uh, quite a good example because you'll never forget the, 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 um, the image of a mitral valve dysplasia because it actually looks like uh, someone clapping her hands, okay? And of course, if we were about to put, if we were to put the color Doppler here, we would see a more or less significant mitral regurgitation too. Of course, that in the first image, we are talking about older dogs, so adult to geriatric dogs. In the first, in the second image, we are talking about young dogs. Then there is another thing that we can do still in the mitral valve, okay? And that is looking at the mitral inflow. So of all the measurements that you can do, and um, 
whenever we do a full scan, sometimes we end up doing lots of measurements, but I'm not going to go through all of them today. I'm just going to show you the most important ones and probably the ones that are going to be easier for you to do in practice. And in, in this case, the mitral inflow is actually quite useful and quite easy to do. And uh, with practice, you'll see that you'll start being quite good at looking at the mitral inflows. So the mitral inflow is the flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And uh, usually we have two different waves when we look at the mitral inflow. So as soon as the mitral valve opens, so when the ventricle starts relaxing and the, the mitral valve opens, we are starting to see the first wave. So the E wave or early relaxation wave, okay? And that is the first wave after the KRS complex. Then after the P wave, so remember that the P wave is the electrical stimulus for the atrial contraction, so for the atrial mechanical contraction, okay? So after this atrial contraction, you're going to have a second wave, which is the A wave, A wave or active feeling, because it happens after the active contraction of the atrium. And so in a normal dog or cat, um, the relationship between them, so the ratio between the E and the A wave should be between one and two, okay? However, you can start having some changings, which can be associated either with, uh, with a degree of um, diastolic dysfunction, so some problems with the relaxation of the heart, or also associated with the increased pressures in the left atrium, which remember, whenever we start having increased pressures in the left atrium, that can be um, associated with congestive heart failure. So which changes then can we have? We can go from a normal pattern, that's a completely normal patient, but then if we start having, for example, a degree of uh, um, diastolic dysfunction, we can start seeing an impaired feeling pattern where the E wave is much shorter than the A wave. And with the progression of the diastolic dysfunction, we can end up into a restrictive feeling pattern where the E wave is much, much taller than the A wave. Of course, that to go from an impaired into restrictive feeling pattern, then the E and A waves, they have to normalize again before they change position. And that's what we call a pseudonormal pattern. How can we differentiate between a normal and a pseudonormal if the ratio between the E and A wave is the same. Well, there are other things that you can look at. So we can, for example, look at the pulmonary venous flow. We could look at the tissue Doppler. However, those are slightly more challenging things. So for today, we are going to focus on the ones that you're probably going to see more frequently in, in practice and the ones that are probably going to give you more information uh, about your patient. And so the ones that uh, we should probably discuss a little bit in more detail, it's the impaired relaxation and the restrictive feeling pattern. So why are these important? Well, if, for example, you have a patient that uh, is uh, tachypneic, dyspneic, you're suspecting, for example, congestive heart failure, um, and in that patient, you look at the mitral inflow and you have an impaired relaxation. So the E wave is shorter than the A wave. We know that this patient is unlikely to be in heart failure. And the reason for this, it's because if you have a patient in heart failure, it means that the pressures in the left atrium are going to be quite high. So the left atrium is dilated. It's under pressure because you have, um, you have, um, actual uh, congestion of the, um, the lungs. You're starting to have high pressures in the left atrium and in the lungs as a consequence as well. So as soon as the mitral valve opens, you have most of the blood going to the left ventricle because it almost works as, a, let's imagine, an escape valve. As soon as the valve opens, boom, all the blood goes to the left ventricle. Okay, so in that scenario, you would have really high E waves and much shorter A waves. So if we see an impaired relaxation pattern, 
we can sometimes be quite happy, not because there is a diastolic dysfunction, but because that patient is unlikely to be in art failure. Okay, and I remember when I was doing my residency, that is something that all the medicine residents would remember. So whenever we were discussing all these patterns, they would always remember impaired relaxation, it's unlikely to be an art failure. So that is one of the important things to remember. And then we just said that if a patient is in art failure, then as soon as the ventricle starts relaxing, then the pressure in the left atrium is going to be so much higher than the pressure in the ventricle that the valve will open and all the blood will go straight away in the early relaxation phase. So that means that whatever is left in the atrium that will go into the left ventricle after the atrial contraction, it's going to be much, much less. So if you imagine this, then you're going to have a really tall E wave and a very short A wave. And that is what we call a restrictive filling pattern. And that can be associated with heart failure. Of course, that you need to keep in mind that all these measurements, they are here to help you um, in the management of the case, but you should not take your decisions purely based on these. So you should always assess your patient as, a, as the entire patient, not just as a measurement. And you need to put all the pieces of the puzzles together. OK, because um, if uh, something in your physical exam tells you otherwise, then you need to do more tests to try to uh, to get to a final diagnosis. So do not take any decisions purely based on a measurement and try to put all the pieces of the puzzle together before uh, taking a decision. OK, so. Um, another thing that um, um, sometimes you will, will see is uh, then this normal or pseudonormal pattern, okay? And uh, in, in, uh, in a normal patient, that's what the normal E to A ratio should look like. We're going to ignore the pseudonormal pattern for now. Then um, there are a couple of things about the mitral inflow that we should remember. One of them is that Whenever we have a very fast heart rate, um, you're not going to have much time for diastole. If you remember, the faster the heart rate, the diastolic time is the one that is going to get more affected. So whenever the diastolic times are shorter, then these E and A waves, they can actually be summated. They can be one on top of the other. So you're not going to be able to see the difference between the E and A wave. That is, of course, a limitation of these um, measurements that, uh, that we can do. Um, what can you do to try to, um, to make the E and A wave separate? Well, the best thing would be to try to reduce the heart rate. Of course, we are not going to give drugs to reduce the heart rate only to assess the mitral inflow. However, if you do calm down your patient, that is probably going to help. And especially in cats, Vagal maneuvers, they tend to work quite well. So for example, if you press on the nose, um, that can sometimes slow down the heart rate. So it's a vagal maneuver. It's going to increase the parasympathetic tone. It's going to slow down the heart rate slightly, even if just for a couple of beats, and it will allow a separation of, um, of the E and A waves. In dogs, if you do want to try a vagal maneuver, then you can try pressing on the eyeballs. Of course, not too much because it doesn't have to be painful. It's just a, a little bit of pressure uh, to try to reduce the heart rate. But sometimes that's not really effective. So unfortunately, it's not always uh, possible, this measurement. And the way that you position your cursor whenever you are checking the mitral inflow, you're going to use your gait, so your sample volume is going to be uh, at the level of the tips of the mitral valve leaflets. Very good. So what else then? You can see here the sample volume just positioned over uh, close to the tips of the mitral valve. So what else can we assess then when we look at the left side views? Well, the next thing that we can do is to look at the left apical five chambers view. And the five chamber view, exactly as it was in the right uh, peristernal views, it's to look at the aorta as well. So the fifth chamber is actually our aorta. 
And in this case, what we do is you just rotate slightly your probe anti-clockwise. And another thing, remember to keep your probe quite flat. So lift the probe to make it quite flat, quite parallel to the floor, because sometimes that is enough to bring up your art into the image. So what, uh, what are we seeing here then? We have our left atrium, left ventricle, and then the aorta is this vessel that you see over here. You can assess the, aorta, uh, the aortic leaflets in this view. You can assess it's um, the beginning of the aortic arch as well. And you're going to assess its anatomy, but also you're going to use the color Doppler to check if there is any turbulent flow or any insufficiency. So remember, if, for example, we were in this view and we had an aortic insufficiency, we would see a red jet going in the direction of our probe. Okay, we don't see any Arctic insufficiency here, but that's how you would see it. Remember all these differences in, in colors. And of course, that uh, after checking the, the color flow through the art and making sure that it's not uh, turbulent, that it's a nice laminar flow, the next thing that we want to do is, of course, to check the velocity of the art. And uh, this is probably the easiest way to check the aortic velocities. There are other ways, um, and in this case, I will be talking about the subcostal views, and I'll show you later on an image so that you are aware of how it looks like and how to do it. But the subcostal views, uh, they are um, quite painful, quite uncomfortable, not painful, but uncomfortable for the patients because you need to put quite a lot of pressure in the abdomen uh, because you're going to be scanning the heart through the abdomen. So you're going to see the liver, the diaphragma, and then you're going to see the heart as well. So you need to put lots of pressure. And especially for large breed dogs, that can be quite uncomfortable. So in most of the cases, especially uh, if you're not really too worried about uh, an arctic or subarctic stenosis where you definitely want to check the velocities in the most accurate way, then the five chamber view, the left apical five chamber view, it's uh, a really good alternative to the subcostal view. So how are we going to assess then the arctic velocities? Well, we are going to place our sample volume, our gate, after the aortic valve leaflets, okay? That's the direction that the flow will have from the left ventricle into the aorta, so just after the aortic valve. And we are going to use the spectral Doppler to check the velocities. In this case, you can probably use um, um, a pulse wave Doppler because it's going to be a low velocity flow. Of course, that if, for example, this patient has a turbulent jet when we put the color Doppler, and if we suspect that the velocity is going to be higher than normal, then <clears throat> you can start your, your assessment with the pulse wave Doppler. And then if that doesn't give you a good image, then you can always use the continuous wave Doppler to assess the velocity better. Okay. So in this case, what you can see here, it's a velocity of around 1.5 meters per second, which would be a completely normal Arctic velocity. And remember, the envelopes are below the baseline because the flow is going away from our probe. But sometimes you can also see some abnormalities here when we look at the art. And one of the things that you can see, for example, it's a subaortic stenosis. So in this case, if you pay attention, you can see the aortic valve leaflet here, but then there is a ridge, so some, um, some obstruction just before our aortic valve. And that is what a subaortic stenosis can look like. So if you see that image in 2D, whenever we put the color Doppler, then we should be able to see the turbulent flow, so this green jet. And if you do see this, um, this green jet, this turbulent flow, that is consistent with a high velocity jet. So you're going to use then your continuous wave Doppler to check the velocity. But this is what a subaortic stenosis would look like. However, still in this view, there are a couple more things that you can actually see depending on your patient. One of them will be this. And now we are talking about cats. 
So if you remember from the, the previous webinar, we talked about uh, cats with HCM and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So whenever you have this systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve that we saw uh, before, this, uh, the fact that this leaflet is being sucked together in, with, the, with the blood and almost touching the interventricular septum, it's causing an obstruction. And because it's causing an obstruction to the blood flow, then we have some turbulent flow in the outflow tract, but at the same time, some mitral regurgitation, just because the leaflet moved from its normal position and the valve is therefore incompetent, okay? However, if you pay attention to this, we said the leaflet is causing a dynamic obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract. So if you do want to assess how significant this obstruction is, you can actually check the velocity of the flow in this left apical five chamber view. So you can check the velocity of the flow in the left ventricular outflow tract. And the typical image of a dynamic obstruction uh, caused by this um, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is this kind of envelope. So it's an envelope with a curvilinear shape, which we call, we call a scimitar shape. Okay, so this curvilinear shape, it's actually very typical of uh, this dynamic obstruction that we can see in cats with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And now I will try not to make things too difficult, but there is another thing for those of you that uh, are keen to do some, some things that may be a little bit more advanced, you could try to start looking at the isovolumic relaxation time. What is that? Well, first of all, if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with this, if you are not too comfortable doing it, it's not a problem. Again, you shouldn't really take um, your decisions purely based on one single measurement. That is by far the most important thing that you can remember from these webinars about echocardiography. Okay. But um, what can what, this isovolumic relaxation time is something that you can definitely measure and that can give you some information about the relaxation of the ventricle but also about the pressures in the left atrium so the feeling pressures in the left side of the heart so what exactly are we talking about when we talk about the IVRT? So the IVRT, isovolumic relaxation time, is the time between the aortic valve closure and the mitral valve opening. So if you think about the heart, when the aortic valve closes, the mitral valve is still closed. So the ventricle starts relaxing and that's when our diastole starts, okay? We start having the beginning of uh, the diastole. And then because the ventricle is relaxing, it gets to a point where the pressure in the left ventricle is lower than the pressure in the left atrium. And that's when the mitral valve opens. And that's when you start having flow again into the left ventricle from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Before that, the ventricle was relaxing, but there was no change in volume of the left ventricle. And that's why we call it isovolumic. So same volume relaxation time because it's the ventricle that is relaxing in that interval, okay? And the normal relaxation time, depending on, of course, heart rates, patients, uh, conditions that uh, are affecting our patients, can be between 40, 65 milliseconds. And that is something that you can start looking at. How do we see it in our images? So let me show you. So usually you put our cursor, you put your cursor in between the inflow and the outflow. So in the left apical five chambers view, you can position your cursor just between the inflow of the mitral valve and the outflow of the aorta. And if you do either pulse wave Doppler, sometimes continuous wave Doppler may give you a better image, but the, the time between the opening of the, the closure of the aortic valve and the opening of the mitral valve, so these clicks, these vertical lines, we call them the valve clicks. The first vertical line is the closure of the aorta. The second, it's the opening of the mitral, okay? So this time, between the two lines, it's the isovolumic relaxation time. 
is that, um, and that is something that you can use to check if it is prolonged. So if there is a problem with the relaxation of the heart or if it is very short, and that would mean that as soon as the ventricle starts relaxing, the pressure in the left atrium is so high that the valve opens straight away. That is one of the things that you can consider. But then there are other things that you can look at. So there is, um, uh, and this is not as basic, I am aware, but um, you can definitely look at the relationship between the E velocity, so the velocity of the E wave that we discussed when we looked at the mitral valve, and the isovolumic relaxation time. So there are studies that show that if you have changes to the E to IVRT, so the ratio between the E and the IVRT, if you have changes to this ratio, then your patients are more or less likely to be in heart failure. So you have um, tables that can can give you all this information for dogs with mitral valve disease. And for example, in this case, we would be talking about a knee to IVRT of around 2.5. Anything over 2.5 can be consistent with heart failure in a dog with mitral valve disease. Dogs with DCM, same thing. So you can see, for example, uh, that patients with DCM that have a knee to IVRT over 1.8, then they are, again, more likely to be in heart failure. But please do keep in mind that sometimes you may have, for example, a dog with a restrictive feeling pattern that is completely symptomatic, no clinical signs, normal breathing, no signs of heart failure. And that can still happen, but you're not going to start treatment on that dog purely based on a single measurement, okay? Very good. So these are things that you can consider. And for those of you that are more keen on investigating these echocardiographic measurements, you can actually look into these in more detail. But then there are other things that we can still do um, with our more basic echocardiography. So in the left apical views, you should also be able to optimize your view to look at the right side of the heart. So if you do uh, slide your probe one or two intercostal spaces cranially, then you will be able to see the right heart in more detail. Okay. If you think about the normal anatomy, the right the right heart is uh, surrounding the left heart and it's usually cranial to the left heart. So if you slide your probe a little bit cranially, then you'll be able to see the right heart in more detail. And in fact, this is what is happening here. So you can see the right atrium, right ventricle, and then the left side of the heart. And if you go even more cranial, and if you start pointing sometimes rather than so much towards the head, but if you start pointing a little bit more towards the spine, you'll be able to see then the right side in more detail. And as we said for the left, you should look at the dimensions of the chambers. And usually the right side is much smaller than the left. And you should look also at the valve. And you should, of course, check the valve with color Doppler to make sure that we don't have any significant regurgitations, which sometimes you do. And in fact, for example, in this case, you can see that uh, you are looking at the right side of the heart. So that's your right ventricle. This is your right atrium. That's the left side of the heart. And you can see a really nice and small central jet of tricuspid regurgitation, okay? And remember, whenever we see um, uh, an incompetent valve, so whenever we see an insufficiency of regurgitation, you're going to check the velocity of the flow. And that is particularly important if we are trying to estimate the pulmonary pressures uh, to check if a patient has a pulmonary hypertension or not. Um, and usually, and that is again slightly more advanced echocardiography, but that is usually done with uh, by looking at the tricuspid regurgitation and the pulmonic insufficiency. So those would be the two um, the two uh, jets that you definitely want to check the velocity. So 
What else can you see when you look at the right side? Well, sometimes you have actually really significant changes in the valve. So I don't think it's, uh, um, I think everyone can see that these valve leaflets are extremely abnormal. So one of the leaflets, it's almost attached to the interventricular septum and not really that mobile and much shorter than the other leaflet. And this other leaflet is much, much longer and uh, quite loose in the ventricle, okay? So this is a typical image of a dog with tricuspid dysplasia, okay? So for example, if you have a young Labrador with a right side systolic uh, murmur closer to the apex, that is the typical um, presentation of a dog with tricuspid uh, dysplasia, okay? So right side murmur close to the apex, systolic, okay? And of course, Labradors and sometimes other breeds as well, but Labradors are by far the most common breed affected by uh, tricuspid dysplasia. And if you do put your color Doppler over the valve, you can see that you have this green turbulent jet that's associated with your tricuspid regurgitation. And of course, we are going to check our velocity. However, keep in mind that sometimes the changes that you see are even more significant than these, much, much more significant. So I can tell you that um, this was a young Labrador that uh, um, presented with um, a right apical systolic murmur. And when you look at the scan, it's almost difficult to understand what is going on because your anatomy is completely different. So this is our left side of the heart. So the left atrium is very small over here. The left ventricle is uh, there. And then all these, it's our right atrium. And you can see that the leaflets are really dysplastic. They barely touch each other, okay? So of course, when we do check with the color Doppler, we can see a significant tricuspid regurgitation, okay? So sometimes the changes that uh, you see, they can be quite exuberant. So they can be really, really prominent. So don't always expect mild changes. Sometimes they can make the anatomy of the heart completely different from normal. Then Another thing that you can still do when we look at the left side of the heart, and this is where things get a little bit more challenging, even by looking at the 2D image, is to look at the left cranial views, okay? So in this scenario, then we are going to turn our probe around 180 degrees, and we are going to slide the probe really, really close to the armpit. And instead of pointing towards the head, we are going to point towards the spine, and we're going to have our probe extremely flat, so almost parallel to the floor, okay? And the image that we are going to get is this type of image. So we have the left ventricle, left atrium, and we have our aorta in a longitudinal view, so quite flat. And you can almost use the aorta. Of course, you can look at the anatomy, look at the shape of the aorta. You can assess the, the you can use the color flow, color Doppler to assess the flow. However, you're not going to measure the velocities of the aorta here because you're kind of oblique, perpendicular to the aortic flow. So your measurement is not going to be reliable. Remember that whenever you're using the spectral Doppler, you want to be as aligned as possible with the flow to get uh, an optimized velocity, okay? So in this case, you can assess the aorta, yes, but you can also use it as a kind of landmark to find the pulmonary artery. So if you put your probe even more flat, and trust me, your hand is going to be quite uncomfortable at that time. If you put your probe even more flat, you're going to see the pulmonary artery. So the pulmonary artery quite um, quite up and straight, okay? So the aorta flat and then the pulmonary artery almost perpendicular to the aorta in this view. And if you look at this, your pulmonary artery seems to be quite well aligned with um, your probe. So this is another view that you can use to assess the pulmonic velocities. And if you want to check, for example, if there is a pulmonic stenosis, or if you want to check if there is a PDA, this is another view that you can use. And sometimes because of the alignment, you will get more reliable results, okay? Again, how do we assess then the pulmonic valve? First into D, color Doppler, and then we are going to use our pulse wave Doppler to check the velocity.
Still, in these cranial views, if you put your probe slightly less flat, one thing that you will see is the left auricular appendage as well. And the left auricular appendage, if you, if you see a, a cat with a dilated left atrium, dilated left auricular appendage, that's the first thing that you're going to see as soon as you put the probe in the left side of the heart. However, in some cats, the left atrium may not be huge, but you still may want to check the velocities of the blood flow in the left auricular appendage. And why is that? Because some studies show that if the velocity is reduced, then you are more likely to start forming clots and uh, having a thromboembolic event, okay? So if you do see your, uh, the tip of your left auricular appendage, you can use your pulse wave Doppler to check the velocities in that position. And what you can see here, it's the, um, the emptying and the filling of the um, left auricular appendage. So as long as the velocities are over 0 0.25 meters per second, that should be overall okay. But if they start to be reduced, then you may start getting worried about the thromboembolic event. Of course, that after saying this, this is an important measurement, yes. But if you do have a patient, let's say a cat with left atrial dilation, and it is a significant left atrial dilation, doing this kind of measurement is not going to change your clinical decision. Because if you do have a moderate left atrial dilation, you know that this patient is already at high risk of having a thromboembolic event. So you are going to start him on medications, even without measuring the velocity, or even if the velocity in the left auricular appendage is completely normal. OK, so that is definitely something to keep in mind. And of course, that if you have patients like this, then you don't even need to measure the velocity because that is definitely not going to change anything at all in your clinical decision. So these patients, these three images are images of left dilated left auricular appendages of cats. And um, you can see not only the smoke, so you can see the smoke quite nicely here and here, but in this patient, you can even see a thrombus floating in the left atrium, okay? So there is no point measuring the left auricular appendage velocity in this patient because you have enough information to tell you that this patient needs to be on antithrombotic medications because there is a high risk of having a, an episode of um, a thromboembolism, okay? So do keep that in, uh, in mind. And then I told you before that uh, I would show you some images of the subcostal views. And uh, the subcostal view, as we said before, it's uh, you are going to scan the, the aorta through the abdomen. So you're going to position your probe just um, after, just close to the end of the sternum, okay? And you're going to be pointing in the direction of the head. So that is going to give you the best alignment of the, the aortic flow because of your anatomy. And so you can definitely use this view to assess the aortic velocities in more detail, in a more reliable way. So you can see that you see the liver first, then you have the diaphragma, and then that's your aorta over here, okay? And you need to put quite a lot of pressure, especially in large breed dogs. And that's why it tends to be quite uncomfortable. I would definitely recommend this view if you're assessing a patient for, uh, for example, a subartic stenosis, if uh, you're uh, screening this patient for subartic stenosis and you want to be as, uh, um, uh, you want to have the best uh, alignment because you want to definitely have um, the most accurate uh, velocity. So this would be uh, definitely a good option in those cases, okay? And uh, there are many other things that we could discuss with the echocardiography, but we'll probably leave that for uh, a different time because I am aware that uh, we are already close to our limit. So I just wanted to... Thank you very much for being here and uh, to uh, be listening to our webinar and uh, tell you again, as Lydia told you before, if you do 
um, have any questions, if uh, you do need our help with the, any, um, well, I was going to say cardiology cases, but we have all the other departments as well. If you do need our help, we'll always be happy to um, to guide you. And with the, the, um, with the cardiology uh, workup, uh, we can, of course, help you with the scan, we can discuss the, the case with you, we can try to um, help you optimizing your views and you would see the improvement, the amazing improvement that you'll see in the technical part of the scan. Uh, over a few scans, you will see like a, a significant improvement. And then of course, it's not just the technique, unfortunately, that's probably the, easiest, the easier part. Um, what can be slightly more challenging sometimes is actually understanding the pathophysiology of your um, of your case and uh, that can sometimes be more tricky and that's why we are here so we can always help you with the, with that whenever it's needed so i don't know if uh, anyone has uh, any questions or not thank you Brigitte, for a brilliant webinar that was so good all the images are amazing so it's really you. nice to illustrate it and so we can understand exactly what we're looking at so thank you for that we do have some questions through already so please feel free to pop them in the question okay. and answer box oh, okay or the chat hello box. sarah uh, <laughs> let me just first see. one is do you have any good resources you would point us towards for the relevant cardiac measurements yeah. for cardiac scans i.e what's normal and what is abnormal for each weight yes yeah, so um so for uh, when we're talking about the weight, so you can, I'm assuming you're talking uh, more about, for example, a, um, a dog with mitral valve disease to check if based on that weight, the, the dimensions of the heart are normal or not. So there is definitely, um, there are tables that you can use. There are formulas as, uh, as well. If uh, probably most of them, like if you Google, um, if you Google uh, allometric scaling, that's uh, the dimensions um index to the body weight for dogs, there will be definitely online tables. Otherwise, we can definitely uh, give you access to, to some of these. In addition to these, you should, like there are lots and lots of echocardiography books, but of course that you're not going to buy all these books. You're not going to even have time to read all these books. And let's not talk even about papers because probably every every other week you have a new paper discussing echocardiography. So that's probably quite a lot, but I would say probably uh, if my recommendation would be to choose a good echocardiography book, get that book, and then over time, depending on which case you're dealing with, start looking at that specific chapter, because I think that's probably the easiest way to learn and to understand how, um, how things are, are done. And in those echocardiography books, you'll have like normal, normal values, you'll have uh, probably these tables that I was telling you about as well. You should you should have them there, okay? And uh, I don't really want to mention one book and forgetting others, but uh, there are definitely two useful, at least two useful and very complete books. One of them is from Boone, the other one from Busadari. So if you do Google them, they will be uh, available. And I'm sure that I'm forgetting some, so I hope no one gets offended. <laughs> so very good. And Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, no worries, no worries. And we had the question what's the difference between diagnosis uh, of tricuspid de degeneration and pht when i haven't okay regurgitations so um so with so we are talking about two different things so the fact that you have tricuspid regurgitation doesn't always mean that you have pulmonary hypertension. And I know, and I'm, I'm leaving it out there, Lydia, but I know that lots of people have, uh, um, like they do struggle or because it is a complex thing actually to understand pulmonary hypertension. So we may even like, maybe consider doing another webinar about pulmonary hypertension and how to, to, yeah. to measure it because it is like quite complex. And if you want to do it in, in detail uh, and to properly understand it, it, it takes a while, but just to try to, to go quickly through, through that, like you can have a, a valve that uh, has degenerated. So like, um, 
with old age and becomes incompetent. And, um, and so that will allow some tricuspid regurgitation without having pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so the way that you check if there is or not pulmonary hypertension is not only with the velocity of the tricuspid and the pulmonic insufficiency, but also with other changes in the heart. So you have changes in the pulmonary artery, you have changes in the right ventricle and in the right atrium. But uh, trying to, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but you can estimate pulmonary pressures by looking at the tricuspid regurgitation, even if you don't have any pulmonic insufficiency, okay? So um, one of them will give you an idea of the systolic pulmonary pressures, the other one of the diastolic pulmonary pressures. But again, this is quite a complex um, um, topic. And just to give you an idea, I usually, when I do um, the CPDs about, uh, um, with echocardiography, usually we stay for like at least 30 minutes to discuss this because it takes a while before our brain actually um, starts uh, interiorizing everything. Okay. But I'm hoping that this was uh, at least uh, useful. A quick, a quick flyby. Um, yeah. Next question. When measuring left auricular velocity are you measuring the flow profile above or below the baseline uh, you can measure both so one of them is the filling the other one is the emptying so emptying and filling of the left auricular appendage so you can measure both okay fantastic and which peaks do you measure for e and a on the doppler so usually the first so if you have an ecg at the same time and this is something that i do recommend because it will make your life much much easier so one thing that um, if you have an ECG running at the same time, the first wave after the QRS complex, that is going to be uh, the E wave, okay? And then the first peak after the P wave, it's going to be your A wave. So you're just going to measure the tip of these envelopes and that will give you the, the velocity. Okay. And I think we answered Sarah's question about books in particular, but just to clarify with the normal measurements of spe speed of blood throw through flu through the valves be included in books yes. like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Like in a, in a, in a good echocardiography book, you'll have everything. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And then uh, the prolapse of the mitral valve means already an advanced stage of disease. And that's a question mark. Um, does that mean it's already B2 or is it possible okay. to still have prolapse in B1? And in this case, should you be starting pimabendon? So the question is, I suppose, if you've got yes. prolapse in the mitral valve. Got it, got it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I um, Ludovica. So um, you can sometimes, even in stage B1, have um, some degree of mitral valve prolapse. So the, um, the decision regarding being a B2 or a B1, it's not based on the on the prolapse. So the same thing for starting PIM or not, it's not based on the, um, on the prolapse. It's mainly, and it should always be, based on the dimensions of the ventricle and the atrium. Okay, so if you do have um, left atrial dilation, left ventricle dilation, that's a B2, and so you're going to start PIMO. Uh, if you have normal left atrium, normal left ventricle, but for example, the generation of the valve, mitral regurgitation, even prolapse, that's still a B1. So you're still going to wait until it becomes a B2 to start PIMO. Fantastic, thank you. We've got a, a blog post actually on our website okay. that talks about when to start Pim and Bend and put together by Zhao. So that's Perfect. a good read if good. you're interested. And someone's asking if you'll get um, CPD certificates for tonight. Yes, we will be sending those. They'll probably come through um, towards the end of the month, early next month with our, all of our, we send our CPD certificates in a big mass email. So, um, but everyone attending tonight will receive that. So hopefully that's, and then we have a quick question about sedation. When do you decide um, sedation is necessary and um, yeah. um, do you have a preferred sedation protocol for ferocious patients? Yeah, well, so usually, like for those of you who work with with VVS, we do have uh, our preferred cardiovascular sedation plan. And uh, if we can scan a patient without uh, without sedation, that's uh, probably better. And uh, that's what we always want to do. But if a patient is really wriggly, like moving too much, it's uh, making your life your life very your job very difficult. Or if the patient is extremely stressed, and that is going to compromise also his stability, then 
it is better to sedate the patient than struggle yourself and struggle and make the patient struggle. So if uh, if I do have to sedate them, I, I do sedate them and I do um, prefer to give them butorphanol. If they are just a little bit wriggly, butorphanol may be enough because it's not a painful procedure, so they don't need to be deeply sedated. And for some of them, if they are just stressed, the butorphanol may be enough, but if not, then you can consider butorphanol, midazolam, and in some cases, um, if they are like extremely aggressive or if they are like really, really too wriggly or trying to move all the time, then you may even have to consider some alfaxone. Of course, that ideally you don't want to do that. And I can tell you that the, the better you become at echocardiography, the less likely you're going to have to, to, to be to use sedation because your scans are going to be quicker. You're going to be much more confident with your scan. So at the end, you're going to be able to do most of the scans without sedation. But when, um, when you're starting and you want to take your time to take a good look at everything, then sedation is going to be much better. Okay. And, uh, just think about if you have a dyspneic patient in heart failure, you would still give him butorphanol because that would help uh, stabilizing your patient. So it shouldn't be a problem to give butorphanol, even if it is just for a scan. Okay, so butorphanol at least, and it will make your life easier, plus or minus midazolam, alfaxolone. And um, remember that um, sometimes like gabapentin or trazodone before the scan will make miracles for these patients. Okay, so I've seen really aggressive dogs that I couldn't even touch without sedation. I asked the owners to give trazodone before the scan and uh, I put the muzzle because I really like my hands, but uh, this patient didn't even try to do anything. Like he was completely fine just with the trazodone. So do keep, uh, keep that in mind, okay? And having IV access, so you've got that flexibility as well as if they do deteriorate. Yes, exactly, so exactly, important. completely, yeah. Um, we have a question. What can you do for mitral and tri tricuspid dysplasia? Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, um, the options are quite limited. So if... Um, if they do, uh, if they are only mild, you may like get away without doing anything. If they become severe, either you treat medically if they go into congestive heart failure, or you may nowadays also consider um, repair of the um, of the valve. So there are surgeries um, in some specific places. Not unfortunately, they are not widely available, and they can be cost prohibitive as well. Unfortunately, but there are um, surgeries that uh, you can consider. So I think in the UK, we'll be talking about um, the quite the RVC and uh, potentially not for dysplasia, but for mitral valve disease. So the generation of the valve, uh, you could consider willows as well. Um, but uh, the, um, for mitral valve dysplasia and tricuspid dysplasia, if we're talking about uh, uh, a surgery, I think probably the quiet and um, and the RVC would be the the only place. As far as I can uh, I can remember, I may be wrong, but uh, those would be things to consider. Unfortunately, uh, I think that even for owners that are insured, um, the cost can still be um, a big problem. But I think over time, things will become cheaper. And you never know if you have an owner that will be happy to pay for even a, an expensive surgery. So always give them the option, definitely. And then our final question for this evening, Brigitte, yeah. um, is a question on how to tell the difference between aortic stenosis and uh, Left, left ventricular, ventricular outflow, outflow tract obstruction. Tract okay, so um, that like sometimes it can be uh, a little bit challenging. So for aortic stenosis, usually you have like an abnormality in the valve leaflet. So the the valve leaf leaflets are thickened, hyperechoic. So you can you, if you put your color doppler, you see that the obstruction starts at the level of the valve. Okay, so that is uh, the aortic stenosis. But you can also have like Subaortic stenosis, and I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but you can also have subaortic stenosis. And whenever you have subaortic stenosis, usually you have, uh, um, you can see it in 2D. Of course, it depends on the severity, but you can sometimes see it in 2D because you have either a ridge or a tunnel lesion before the valve. Okay. However, there are other things that can be a little bit tricky, and that's when 
there is more debate uh, happening. So if you have a dog or a cat even, but most times in this case would be a dog with mitral dysplasia, um, there is, um, there is a, a component of this mitral dysplasia that can lead to a kind of uh, uh, outflow tract obstruction with, um, with one of the leaflets of the, of the valve. And so there is a mix between this subaortic stenosis and the, the mitral dysplasia that can sometimes happen. And those are slightly more difficult sometimes to, to diagnose if it is one or the other, or if you have both or not. But I guess it depends a little bit more on the, um, on the morphology of the valve, on your assessment on the 2D, of course, also the color Doppler, but mainly on the anatomy of, um, of the valve and looking in, in detail at the outflow tract as well. Okay, and uh, one thing that I would suggest, if you do have um, like a patient that you suspect as a, an outflow tract obstruction, and you're not sure if it is a, a subaortic stenosis or if it is um, one of the leaflets of the mitral valve that is contributing to this, try to assess it in um, different views because sometimes in one of the views you may see like a ridge uh, just below the valve that is more consistent with the subaortic stenosis or maybe you will see like the the valve uh, contributing the leaflet of the valve contributing to the obstruction and then you'll be thinking okay maybe it is more related to uh, to the mitral dysplasia but these are luckily they are not as common cases and Another thing is that most of the times at the end of the day, like the treatment that you're going to, to do for most of these patients doesn't really change much, even if you have like different, um, different pathologies. In some scenarios, they can change because you're talking about pimobendin, beta blockers, like completely different medications. But if they become symptomatic, then the treatment luckily doesn't change that much. Okay. Fantastic. Well, and oh, sorry, there is a last one. Uh, where should we place? Sorry, Lydia. Where should we place the um, the cursor to check for pulmonary velocity? So you need to put the the gate below the valve. So think about the blood flow. If the blood flow goes from the ventricle into the pulmonary artery through the pulmonic valve, then you need to put the gate after the pulmonic valve on the side of the pulmonary artery because that's where the flow is going through. Okay, so that's where you want to put the, the gate. Lovely. Thank you so much, Brigitte. I think that's all our questions answered. And if anyone is interested in working with Brigitte um, with VVS, then please do get in touch. I know we've got other questions in. Um, uh, thank you. Some thank you messages coming through. So, so thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Brigitte, for a really interesting and really practical um, session. It's been great. Uh, going through everything. Thank you everyone for attending on a warm June evening. We mm -hmm. really enjoyed um, meeting with you and hope you can work with us soon. So thank you and thank you Brigitte. Hope you have a thank lovely you, rest of your evening. Thank you guys and it was uh, nice to see you and thank you so much for the questions because usually there are not many questions so today it was uh, different Lots of and questions. it was very nice. Very, Lots very of nice. good questions too. Thank you everyone. Thank have a lovely you. Evening. Bye bye.